Welcome to Tales from the Pit. This is your content warning. This week I'll be speaking with Christian Ramirez on topics as diverse as being a child of divorce, parental absence, and, because this is how Christian rolls, also evolutionary theory and the daredevil gene. Those triggered by high-level science should skip this one. Everyone else, brace yourselves for the pit. took seven installments of Tales from the Pit, but we're finally here. We've plumbed seven circles of the hell that is about half of life, if you're lucky, and, like Dante, we have returned, not only with cool snapshots of adulterers getting eaten by depressed maggots in a trench of lackluster Mexican food or whatever, but also with perspective, with an antidote for the chaos that racks our minds and souls. At long last, we have found someone to blame. This episode is in honor of those original sinners. Whether their trespass was too much involvement or not enough, or just the right amount, but then later you decide there's something wrong with it for no reason. Yes, we are told to honor thy mother and thy father. But is it not also natural, almost a commandment of our very beings, to sacrifice their memories for all of our scapegoating needs. Hammer toes? Mom probably bought you the cheap shoes. Bitter? Well, Dad left. And, what's worse, he never brought back that pack of smokes he promised. Violent schizophrenia? How can that not, at times, feel like a genetic albatross around your neck? But, figure this shit. Your parents used to be kids. And they were getting messed up by their parents who in turn got completely dismantled by the dinosaur midwives who raised them. To keep on a Bible tip, does it not stand to reason that the blame ultimately rests with the original parental units? So fuck you, Adam and Eve, for being the first ones to make a mistake, the rock in the pond that makes the ripple, for starting a chain reaction of strife and pain that works itself out like a slow-burning chemical fire across the surface of a millennia of tortured, dissatisfied souls, like those little eel things in Ursula's cave. Hell, maybe Cain would have spared Abel if he'd had more structured family time, or if Adam did flashcards with him as a baby instead of embracing his dual passions, nudity and catastrophic herpetology. Although I think it recently came out that those flashcards are actually bad for your baby. So, I guess the point is, good luck not fucking up your kids, which you will, if you have them. Because you, like your parents, are only human. That realization, of course, seems simple enough, but it's a major milestone in most of our lives. Reckoning with your parents as living, breathing, flawed mortals who must have, it stands to reason, had nasty animal sex at least once to bring you into being. That milestone can come in many forms. Sometimes it's a slow growth thing, a dawning that demands more responsibility from you even as it sets you on the path to your own children, your own death, your own maturity. It can be something as codified as a coming of age ritual, as innocuous as finally dehorsing your father at the yearly family joust, or as dramatic as abuse, neglect, utter absence, or most unforgivable of all, a failure to teach you the finer points of equestrian jousting, the sport of kings. To get a handle on how big nurture, or the lack thereof, affects us, we're forced to balance genes versus choice on the precipice between childhood and adulthood. It's a complex thing, 
Maybe the Bible is no longer the best analog, considering the big shift in your relationship with the folks can often feel like a loss of faith. Instead, let us turn to a world much more familiar to guys like Christian and me, family sitcoms of the 1980s. You may have noticed that the fictive television universe of the 80s and early 90s experienced a troubling rash of orphans and characters with divorced parents. Cracked once published a theory about that, namely that the legalization of no-fault divorce in 1970 gave rise to a pattern of shows designed, whether consciously or not, to help those coming of age in divided households and help the country as a whole work through this new thing, figure out what a quote-unquote normal divorce should look like in America. It is perhaps pants-shittingly terrifying that our culture negotiates such issues via forums like Diff Rent Strokes and Punky Brewster, and then later Tailspin and Darkwing Duck, but we do. We tell stories that reflect and shape our culture, and pop culture affects us and reflects what we're going through most of all, and with the most immediacy. That, of course, is why ALF will forever stand alongside the Outsiders as one of our finest examinations of growing to feel like an alien other in your own home, and that cats are delicious. Whether the story followed a little robot girl, a sky-surfing bear cub raised by pirates, or two adopted kids getting molested in a bicycle shop, this was a unique period in narrative history where we all tried collectively to figure out what the hell this new kind of family unit looks and feels like. And you know something? Well, all us kids of divorced or absent parents were busily accepting our childhoods as normal, I think what those shows revealed is that we are, each of us, on an absolutely unique journey. For me, divorce meant less yelling in the house, weekend movies with dad, and two Christmases. Divorce is dope. It involved both of my parents growing as individuals, modeling that growth for me at a crucial time in my own development, and revealing themselves both to be happier people with an undying friendship between them once the cord was cut. For others, less lucky, it's all cat-eating and sky pirates. Or, you know, the much, much worse actual life challenges those are a metaphor for. Not just abuse or dysfunction, but absence. An absence that forces you to mad-libs together your own image of what an adult is. From friends, colleagues, and yes, cheesy sitcoms. Because you need something to aim for. Because you are becoming an adult at a surprisingly rapid pace. I don't think it's an overstatement to say that cheesy sitcoms even those written by Hollywood hacks phoning in their 400th script, shape us fundamentally and irrevocably. Fuck. Cue laugh track. Fade to credits. This has been your life, and guess what? With enough perspective, it turns out it wasn't This Is Us after all. It was more like growing pains. And the last thing you see before the episode ends, that final flash on the screen... Executive produced by Chuck Lorre. Sorry. Now to provide an utterly different perspective, because that's really his only option, please welcome Christian Ramirez into the pit. L.A. People from all over that are not used to getting rain. Is that what it is? I think so. Okay. We're already clogged because we have too many people. We're talking about traffic <laughs> in LA in a light drizzles, people. Meanwhile, there's bombogenesis and like bomb cyclones happening yeah. on the East Coast. Oh, God. Yeah. When we're trying to get somewhere, if it starts to drizzle slightly, no, yeah. everything comes nope, to a standstill. No good. <laughs> One too many variables just got injected into that equation. The older I get, the more I can sort which uh, hack need stand-up routines are accurate and which are not <laughs> and the hey every, people who know i don't know how to drive in the rain totally accurate yes <laughs> you know the other one that amazed me is when i got into this industry and moved to la for mm-hmm. that express purpose i have met so many producers who mm-hmm. 
exemplify the stereotype of producer. Like we met <laughs> with a guy who will go nameless who's like, you got to forgive me, guys. I'm still a little on coke from like <laughs> being at the Sky Bar last night with Joaquin. Oh, my god. You know gosh. what I mean? Joaquin Phoenix. Yeah. And he's wearing, he's like a super white dude wearing like a do-rag. And you're just oh, like, Jesus, God, nuts. I thought this was a parody, but yeah. it's not. No. <laughs> Why? Why yeah. does it have to be this guy? <laughs> yeah. All right. Now that the vibe is right. All right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the pit, the pit of despair. Mm-hmm. Thanks for joining us. Yeah. Mind uh, introducing yourself for the people? Hi, I'm Christian Ramirez. I used to work at Cracked, and now I work with Small Beans. That's right, among other things. Mm -hmm. Uh, New host of Pop Culture Petri Dish, our latest and greatest show on the Small Beans Network. But that's not why you're here today. (laughs) No, that is not why I'm here today. You're here today to explore whatever is the most dramatic thing in your life. Take it away, Christian. (laughs) No, actually, full disclosure, we were originally going to talk about microaggressions, which I still think would be a great episode. Yeah, we should do that. But you wanted to do more of a get to know you episode, right. which is in a. There's been two formats with this show. Right. Your individual like story, like basically the same thing a therapist would ask yes. you for your first session, <laughs> and then people who are experts on a topic, like we had Jamila right. Dawson, who's a sex therapist, talk about uh, issues around that topic. So let's do a get to know you. And then we'll come back at a later date okay. and do microaggressions. Okay, yes, that sounds good. Um, so I grew up here in Southern California. Mm-hmm. I'm from the mountains uh, around Lake Arrowhead. Running Springs is actually where I grew up specifically. Oh, okay. Yeah. My parents just moved to Crestline. Okay, which yeah. Which is a couple so, miles from Arrowhead. Yeah. yeah. So I know that whole area. Um, that's that's where kind of that's where my roots are. Um, I guess I guess the biggest thing that's appropriate to this show Mm -hmm. is that when I was about four years old, my parents got divorced. So, um, I've lived with my mom when I was growing up and I have a stepdad, but my birth father, I got some weekends with him when I was growing up Mm -hmm. and he'd cancel or he'd be late or whatever. But for the most part, he wasn't super involved in my life has never really changed that Mm -hmm. at all. And, and what's his name and email address and <laughs> home address for fans at home? No. <laughs> no, that's, that's unnecessary. He lives in Columbia now. So okay. even if I, I don't even know what his address is because I, All right. I talked so to him. that's the depth of detachment at this right. point we're talking about. Okay. Yeah. Sure. I only see him at most once a year mm-hmm. and that's for Christmas with the his side of the family. Cause I stayed close with them. I'm still close with my, oh, good. my grandpa and my aunts and everything. Um, now is that, does that feel healing or does that make it even more awkward that you would like be close with a generation above, right. but the dad doesn't put in the effort. It's it. I, I would say that, um, it feels good now to know mm-hmm. that it's like, cause they, they're my family. They're right. absolutely my family and they could have made the same choice that he did to kind of just not be a part of my life. Right. But they didn't choose to do that. They made a point of actually like connecting and staying, uh, yeah, being a part of my life. And so that's now, yes, it is certainly, it is certainly a thing that I look fondly upon mm. when I was growing up and like, being a teenager and stuff like that, going through all this stuff that teenagers already go through. Plus why is my dad not a part of my life and not necessarily thinking about that all the time, but looking back on it, knowing that, yeah, that's, that was what was going on at the time. Did that only come later looking back or were there because so full disclosure, so people know where we're coming from. I think context is important. My parents got divorced when I was, eight I think Mm -hmm. could have been seven or nine I'm a little unclear (laughs) um and that was straight up just because they fought all the time and were very distant emotionally and then a few years later my dad realized that he was gay and that that he hadn't re and that's such a unique not totally unique but um different circumstance right because it 
alleviated so much pressure instantaneously yeah. in a way because it was she my mom didn't have to question about right. dynamics or bad she was yeah. just like oh he's gay because yeah. like one of the issues is like you know you never show me affection and it was like right. wow i'm gay i realized <laughs> and it immediately made them best friends so we still went oh, back and good. forth from household to household mm-hmm. but they were just very very close yeah um, so that's where I'm coming from. And I am curious about if you don't mind talking about yeah. what was the relationship between your birth parents like as that was unfolding? Cause in my case, it was very much like everything was fighting all the time mm-hmm. and then they broke up and everything was great. Oh, okay, and I yeah. loved it. <laughs> uh, <yeah. laughs> now, um, I was, I was pretty little at the time. I was, I think I was mm-hmm. about four or five when they divorced. So I don't have a lot of concrete memories. I do remember, I mean, because when you're that small, you kind of still maintain like an emotional memory of that kind of stuff. Yeah. I remember anger. I remember there being a lot of tension. And my mom tells this story because this is the moment she knew. The moment she knew that she and my dad needed to be divorced was they had had a big fight. And I went to her and I said, Mom, why is dad so mad at us? Mm. And it was the fact that I questioned whether he was mad at both of us or just her that she said that was the moment she knew. All right, this isn't it's affecting the kids. Yeah. 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 And so that once they divorced, they were always very cordial. Mm-hmm. My mom is, I can't, I, I will probably say a lot of good stuff about my mom in this, but she is the best. She's, she tried to make sure. And I've only found out later that as an adult that she was angry at him Mm. obviously because he neglected me and but she never showed it to me she was very polite she was Mm. very much we're very different there (laughs) she was very supportive of um, me spending time with him when he would be able to spend time with me and she was always trying to get him involved yeah I now know she was very angry with him. I see. My parents did another thing, which I think is a somewhat classic trope where both behind the other's back are like, <laughs> and my mom's going to hear this, but <laughs> I like, well, you know, your mother's always like this way. <laughs> I'm like, well, you know, you can chalk that up to how your dad is right. blah, blah, blah. Um, there was a little of that, but still very, I think, close friends to yeah. this day. Yeah. And I think part of the reason that there wasn't that much of that is because mm-hmm. my parents, I honestly don't think they knew each other that well. Uh, okay. cause I was not intended. They were not right. married or Me anything. Neither. Right. Accident high five. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> it should be accidental at some point. We oh, accidentally high five. High five. Yeah. We should have mushed each other's yeah. faces uh, and been like... <laughs> Right, it should but, be yeah. a fucked up high five. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but yeah, um, we. So yeah, they. I don't think they knew each other that well because they were romantically involved, and okay. I don't even know how long they were dating before I was conceived. But then, after my mom had me, they decided to get married because Man, that's what you do. Too. That's such a generational thing. Yeah. Where at least I think in current like millennial and beyond American culture. Right. You would not feel obligated to get married yeah. just because someone got pregnant. You'd like work out what the woman mm-hmm. wants to do because yeah. it's her body. Like yeah. figure out your involvement, <laughs> which could end up in marriage. But yeah, my parents also were like, well, that's that. Yeah. I guess we're getting married. We got this thing. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, so that's, I, yeah, I don't think they knew each other that well when I was conceived or when I was born. And so in addition to raising me and stuff like that, there was the added pressure of getting to know each other and like sure. living together. And that's, that's too much for any relationship, but I know for sure my dad was not ready for it because at the age that it began un- yeah, unfolding. Uh, yeah. yeah. My mom was 20 when she had me, he was 21 Okay, and he was not ready to stop partying. And mm. he's, he kind of repeated that pattern because he was still not ready to stop partying 10 years later when my half brother was conceived with somebody else. And I think he's finally settled down because now there's a, I have a half sister okay. whose mother he is married to and she is 20 years between me and her. So yeah, that's another thing I can't grapple with that. I know a lot of people listening to this will have dealt with, and again, I'm sorry, you're in the pit. You're in the pain, pain pit. Yeah. <laughs> so sorry if it's triggering. <laughs> but uh, 
How does that make you feel as someone who has an experience that my mom did get remarried, but she also made sure the primary relationship, I guess what I'm getting at is, so he's remarried now and seems to have become Mm -hmm. an adult or more mature in some way. How do you feel about that? Is it easy to be pleased that as an individual he's maturing or does it feel like a r- fucking ripoff that he couldn't <laughs> be a dad for you at that right. time, you know? There's there was when my half brother um was born, there was some anger there because and at the time it was because it was like, oh, well, he's trying. I see him putting an effort with him, which he eventually skipped out on, too. Mm. Um, and was that a case of infidelity at the time? Um, no. OK. They he were was, separated. Yeah. OK. Um, he was with he. Yeah. He didn't even marry my half brother's mother. Gotcha. So um, he just got her pregnant. Things didn't work out and they went their separate ways. Um, yes, there was a part of me when I heard that he was married to and raising my half sister that was wounded by that. Sure. Just because it's, it's an additional wound on top of years and years and years of scar tissue. That's what it was. And now with our relationship is so, it's so superficial me and my dad because i'm always going to be polite to him right there's always a part of me that's going to want him to be like hey i messed up Mm. i owe you a lot and that i could never give you and i'm going to want to hear that probably for the rest of my life and it's never going to happen and i've accepted that it's never going to happen pretty sure okay i'm as positive as i can be that he's not gonna feel sorry because i'm 32 years old now and it yeah. hasn't happened. And he's had, he's been Our called. Our parents accidentally got pregnant on like the <laughs> same month, probably. <laughs> it's good to know. <laughs> but yeah, it's. Okay. The, yeah, it's, it's at the point where he's been called out on it by my mom, by one of his sisters, by his parents, and he's never okay. made an effort to apologize to me. If so, I may tell two quick anecdotes. Yeah. Uh, I just think that's a really important issue how much it can mean. It's interesting because my grandfather, uh, I think this is safe to say a, cause he'll never hear this and B because he's, he apologized. So he must realize on some level, my grandfather owed my mother very extreme apologies and it's not my place to go into detail, but just trust me. And it took him till he's like 75, but he did do an apology. And despite all the distance and, reasons that i can't wrap my head around why they would ever have a relationship again essentially Mm, right it meant so much to her it like meant the world yeah and then similarly there is a person in her life who the relationship isn't nearly as strained but it's clear that the other person has no interest in anything other than denying their understanding of their part in anything that happened and it just makes such a difference it's it's very it's weird yeah. how there's a different depth of relationship because uh, my dad and I have also definitely become very just cordial and superficial like we love each other but things are just very friendly and basic yeah um, may I ask what your dad does he does sales He's, okay all right does international like sales in our case, it's a whole different topic, I guess, for another episode, sure. because it's that my dad dreamed of being a filmmaker and his life was much less privileged than mine. He was work. He was living alone in a garage, working at a 7-Eleven when he was 14 and supporting okay. himself. And uh, he's a very talented filmmaker, mm. but just instead got pregnant with me and like had to sure. devote his life to doing an adjacent industry that... Yeah. Um, and now there is palpable jealousy, which is super weird as an adult. Oh, okay. So like when we explore in a family setting that, oh, Michael got this meeting with so-and-so about his movie, he'll say something passive aggressive. It's very weird. Yeah. It makes me feel extra weird because he's my dad. It's yeah. so odd. Yeah. I can understand that. I definitely understand that. I um, think sons and fathers end up at a superficial level sometimes because yeah. it's hard to get to the root of things. Mm-hmm. 
No, I, I agree. There's a part of our culture that doesn't gratify male emotional vulnerability. Mm-hmm. So it's hard. It's automatically harder. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. It's because it's an awkward conversation to begin with. And then there's everything in our world tells us that we're not supposed to have these kinds of conversations and that kind of stuff. Um, but on that subject of, I can relate to the way that your mom feels about it. Kind of, I don't know exactly what her experiences are, but there's, I will say that the difference for me is that maybe it's not a difference. There's a part of me that, 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 knows that he's not going to apologize, but there's also a part of me that can't hang on to the hope that he will because that just makes the wounds feel more immediate, more present now when he's not actively doing anything at Mm -hmm. this point to, to hurt me or anything. Right. So I, I shouldn't hold on to that. And also I, for my own life's sake and my own mental clarity, I need to not hold on to it. (laughs) How are you in general at compartmentalization in your life? Pretty good. Okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's something that I started learning when because of my parental situation. And then it, I did it more when I was in the military because mm-hmm. there's, I was deployed to Iraq twice. There's a part of my brain that cannot possibly be thinking about home. That needs to be put away in a little box while I am while doing, you're deployed, yeah, sure. while I'm out doing combat missions and stuff like mm-hmm. that. There's so, yeah, I'm pretty good at it. Uh-huh. <laughs> I'm good at making sure I don't let out certain things or yeah, I'm good at keeping things separate in my head. Well, God, man, I got to speak for the listener on this one. Yeah. Did you see combat in Iraq? Yes. How are we not? How is that not the episode? (laughs) You pitched me microaggressions. How about macroaggressions? Yeah. Just aggression. Well, we, we certainly haven't done an episode with a veteran who saw combat. So that would be a topic for another, another day as well. Sure. We can. Yeah. We, I'm, Oh, unless it's too fresh for you. Like I, unless you don't want to Um, certainly invite only on the pit. No, yeah, (laughs) that's no, we can do it for sure. Sometime. Um, I will say that one thing just, I guess, teaser for that. Uh, Mm. one thing that helps me, that helped me cope with it and helped me kind of make sure that none of that stuff hung on to me too hard. Sure. Was immediately after I got out of the military, I decided to go to acting school and there, and there's a lot of silly things about acting school that we can make fun of, but there is a part of it that just doing um, sense memory stuff. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Really helped me mm-hmm. go through that kind of go through those memories and kind of confront them, accept them and let them go. Sure. And it it one it helped me with getting my acting teachers to like me because they're like oh you but can, it's also free you therapy. can go there you right like exactly yeah. yeah it was theater class and therapy yeah, yeah. <laughs> all at once totally and so yeah that's that's one thing that certainly helped me with readjusting to just sure. to what is normal life all right let's see i want to launch us in a new direction yeah i would ask first of all And I think this is, I want to get more perspectives from female guests as well. Because I wonder if it's just the Oedipal Oedipal cross-gender thing. Yeah. Uh, We haven't discussed your relationship with your mom, although you briefly alluded to probably saying great things about her. Yeah. Has that just been an always like an easy, great relationship? It's okay. Because that's kind of the situation with me. Right. I I wouldn't say it's always been easy because as a teenager, I'm sure I was a handful and just cause I was, there was a point there when I was pretty angry, not with her, but I'm sure it came out as probably feeling some anger at her. Did you feel there was any hormone aspect? Like, was it a teen? okay. Probably That's for- something I don't access at all. Cause I never rebelled at all ever. Yeah. Um, but I understand everyone else did. So I'm fascinated <laughs> by that. <laughs> I, I never rebelled super hard against my mom specifically. Sure. Um, because, she was she was a little more loose with her way the, with her way of parenting me because she taught me when I was young mm-hmm. pretty much to trust her and she loved me as much as she could so I never felt a lack there or a need to like push back against her 
Um, cause she was also never tried to put any super strict rules on me or anything either. I think that's an important point for parents that I don't know if it always works. So right. I say it with a grain of salt, but I, that's what I was about to ask you. Did you have basically no rules? Yeah. Short of like, don't do something stupid. Right. I, I, I did, did too, so there was no reason to rebel. Right. Like, I realized in retrospect, if my parents had said, no, 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 pot is the devil, then I would be fascinated. <laughs> right. Or like, no, sex before marriage is evil. Right. I would be like, that's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> but my parents were always like, if you have questions, come to us, we'll explain yeah. it to you. And then we'll give you guidance. Yeah. And as you age up, you'll be able to make more and more of your own decisions. Yeah. And I was like, well, there's nothing really to like rebel against. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, very much. effective. Yeah. yeah. Um, she, she gave me rules about not smoking weed. And that was mostly because it was illegal. Right. She was like, don't. And That's then, my mom. I was like, I just don't want you to get arrested. Right. I, I don't want you to get in trouble. It was a lot of that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, I was, it was pretty, and I don't know if it was because she knew I was having a hard time. Mm -hmm. So she kind of used kid gloves with me for lack of a better word. But, um, yeah. And I was never super rebellious. I mean, even when I was little, she likes to tell the story. She likes to call me, say that I was a little old man when I was a little kid. Cause I didn't, I didn't cry a lot. I was not a very troublesome. I never cried as a baby. Yeah. And yeah, there's a running joke that like I have an 80 year old man's soul yeah. in my body. Yeah. yeah, it's essentially the same thing. Just like been calm and like chilling out. Yeah, yeah <laughs> pretty much. And so there was there was that part of me like I liked to wear like sweater vests with stuff and like <gasps> I was a, <laughs> I was an adorable little old man. Nice. And and that's probably because I was raised around my mom and then we lived with my grandma and my great grandmother for a little bit. So. It was just like, just be nice. And I was, I've never had a problem just being nice. How was school with the sweater vests? Cause I wore sweater vests too. Did you get bullied at all? I did a little bit. A little bit. Okay. Yeah. Um, I mostly didn't hang out. I, I, I mean, you try to avoid people who are bullies when you're a kid, but My it's almost were, impossible yeah. too. My parents were very conscious of the school district. So yep. I avoided the trope of largely, there are a few incidents, sure. but uh, I should have been like people who remember getting stuffed in lockers, thrown in dumpsters, yeah. their asses kicked. I was begging for it. And it only <laughs> happened once or twice. And then the other kid right. usually got suspended or expelled. Like <laughs> yeah. I was just in very high quality, strict yeah. school district. <laughs> I, <laughs> I think, um, man, I got, sweater vest though. Yeah. I yeah. Had them. yeah. When, when Do I was you, little, it wasn't yeah. a big deal obviously but um once i started getting into junior high and high school kids were because where i grew up i mean you've if you've been around the mountain there's it's mostly white people that live up there. right yes so i did get some racially based bullying and stuff like that once i got into junior high and high school and so yeah the that kind of happened but i also when i'm i established a precedent i guess pretty early when i was in junior high that these kids were picking on me and I stood up to them and I basically challenged them to a fight and they stopped. Oh, and so I think at that point they were obviously acting out cause they had problems too, <sighs> but they pushed me hard enough sure. and I was like, no, I'm it's not going to fucking stand up for this. It's that you have that in you though. Yeah. I mean, congrats. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, you also served in the military, which I'd be terrified yeah. to do. Uh, my equivalent of that, we have a lot of parallels, I'm okay. realizing. But this is so telling. My equivalent of that is a kid came to school and he showed me bullets. Not a gun, just bullets. Mm-hmm. And said, I'll, I'll bring the gun tomorrow. I have these bullets. That's terrible. <laughs> it's scary at the time, but in yeah. retrospect, it's dumb. It's like, if you were going to do a school shooting, dude, you would have done it. Like, sure. this is not credible threat but anyway (laughs) sure i paid him fifty (laughs) dollars oh no to fake a fight with me after school where i won and Uh, i ended up having to pay him like remittances because he was like you know it's been six weeks i might tell people and i'm like here's another 15 
but oh, dude, that, no one ever bullied me again because I had beaten yeah. up one bully. Yeah. But the fa- the fight was literally we kind of became friendly with each other. Okay. Because in order to stage this fight, we had to like we hang to out after together. school and do backyard <laughs> wrestling and choreograph a yeah. fight. So we kind of got oh, to know each great. other. That's my solution. That's really interesting. It makes sense that we're both comedians, though. I think. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. There was and. Okay, I'm gonna. T- I can tell this story. Do it. That kind of is. Um, I guess we'll highlight. Uh, I guess who I am and with the military and with standing up to bullies and stuff like that. Um, my mom has always done a really good job of instilling in me, like bravery and having mm-hmm. personal courage and stuff like that. <clears throat> and she's always spoke to me about the importance of it, because when <laughs> one time I got chased by somebody's dog who was just out and it was an aggressive dog it was a big i can't even remember what it was because it's it's a monster in my mind because i was i was in about like third or fourth grade at the time so i was walking home chasing you (laughs) i was walking home and this dog just chases me down the block i get away from it um but my mom and of course this is probably where i get it from i get home i'm crying i'm just terrified and she's like, what happened? And I tell her that this person's dog was out and it chased me. And the first thing she does is she grabs a baseball bat and takes me to the back to that person's house. And is okay. <laughs> yeah. she's straight up just, if that dog attacks my kid again, <laughs> yeah. then we're going to have a real problem. And never happened again. There you go. And, I, and sure, that's maybe wasn't the best way to resolve it, but... <sighs> It's tough for me because I was on the receiving end of that. Okay. But, her but our instincts... dog didn't get out. Okay. <laughs> our dog howled all night. Oh, okay. Because it was a hound dog puppy that was still being trained. Sure. And the people left a note anonymously that said, we'll poison your dog oh with like God. poison beef okay, if yeah. you don't sell it. So we had to sell it. Yeah. Oh, and that's was, awful. So I'm protective of dogs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and my mom's problem wasn't with the dog. But you can't have a dog get out. That's right. key. That is key. You can't and just clear. let it chase kids. And so that's and dogs that are not hard to me. train people, right? When someone has a dog that's like mean and aggressive, nine times out of ten the person's an asshole because yeah, it's not that exactly. hard to have a chill. And that's dog. what it was. <laughs> yeah, that's that's exactly what the problem was at the time too. Because I, I mean, we we've had dogs, and eventually once I got bigger, mm-hmm. then that dog got older and stuff, and I was like, oh, this this dog doesn't have a problem. It's mm. the people that live there that yeah. have the problem. Yeah, and so. Yeah. And so that led to me when I was about around the same age, probably maybe a year later, um, I was walking to the bus stop and these mountains, there's national forest two blocks away from Mm -hmm. me. And so I'm, I'm, I know I was about the same size though. And wait, as you are now or as the antagonist (laughs) in the story, as as I was when I had been chased by the dog. So I was about third grade. Okay. fourth grade um and so i was walking walking to school i walked to the bus stop by myself every day and god it must have been because i i grew up in a uh foothills town okay and i remember waiting for the bus stop at 6 a.m and being like this is inhumanly cold i can't imagine what fucking <laughs> yes. lake arrowhead bus stop was it, like it it was cold i mean it, <laughs> yeah. it was not fun but um and so I'm walking to the bus stop yeah. and I turn a corner where I can see up a long street and there's a coyote standing there. And of course, in my head, it's still like a big coyote. And like, and like now in my head, it's still, it's another monster. There aren't really huge coyotes. Right. They're not exactly. that big. Yeah. I know that now, <laughs> yeah. but my little, little kid me in my brain, it's another monster. And it's, it's like a werewolf. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and it's staring at me. And of course, now I know that it was staring at me because it was shocked. It's like, oh, this thing came around the corner. But then I was like, oh, (laughs) I'm freaking breakfast for this thing. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to run back home again. I really wanted to run home. Did you think I'm going to die? I have to like come to grips with dying now today. I... I don't know if it was that specific a thought, <laughs> sure, yeah. but there was some drama in my this head about it. End. This is, this is me. <laughs> yeah. And so it was, you know what, if it's going to attack me, I'm going to go down fighting. 
okay. in my head wow. as a little kid. <laughs> I wish I had that in me. And so I, in, as I picture it now, I stood there and I roared at it and I ran towards the coyote and it scared it away. It ran mm-hmm. away. And so, of course, there was a little kid yelling at a coyote at like seven in the morning. Yeah. And so it's a little silly <laughs> just to know that. But that's that's why I am who I am. Part oh, of it. dude, I what that coyote run in. Yeah. I just wrote a coyote run in as a seminal part of why a character is why they are in a screenplay we're trying to get produced. <laughs> Coyotes have always been very spiritual to me. Yeah. Um, but I can top that for embarrassingness. So yeah, I don't feel ahead. bad. <laughs> My mom used to walk our chihuahua on the golf course all the time. Okay. And one time a coyote came out and was going to eat our chihuahua, which is feasible. It's yeah, a chihuahua. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> and it ran. The chihuahua ran back to my mom and jumped in her arms. And she scared the coyote away by yelling, which is true. I'm a fucking lawyer. <laughs> and the coyote ran away. That's fantastic. That was what That's her great. brain leaped to for yeah. aggression. <laughs> That's the most terrifying thing yeah. about her. <laughs> and then to contrast with that, you reminded me of my raccoon story. Okay. Which is when I was living in the dorms at UCSD one night, I came home after studying at like 2.30 in the yeah. morning, and there was a raccoon in front of me on this very narrow path that's yeah. uh, with steep walls on both sides. So mm-hmm. you're just on the path. Yeah. And there's a T-bone intersection. Yeah. And as I approach it, the raccoon's at the end of the T-bone and it's looking at me and I go, oh, hey, little fellow. Wow, what a cute raccoon. <laughs> then I look to the left and the right down the T-bone and there's a raccoon on either side. <laughs> oh like they're literally doing the thing that the velociraptors <laughs> yeah. do in Jurassic Park to me. <laughs> and I was scared shitless. <laughs> It was oh, just like great. your experience, except unjustified. Like <laughs> I had no reason to feel that frightened, but I was like, what's going on? Oh, uh, that's <laughs> funny. They're smart, though. They are very smart little creatures. They're smart, but I don't know how much they can actually hurt you. Nah, yeah, I don't think, unless they have rabies or something, then that's the only thing that they could really do to hurt you. <laughs> they could scratch you and bite you. But, eh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I heard... I got to look into this though. Yeah. The rabies is basically extinct now or defunct now. Like, yeah, there's, it's, there's less than one case a year reported. Sure. And I know, like, I know in places like England, they've completely eliminated it. Yeah. Um, which is why there's a whole bunch of like crazy, like tests that you have to do with your dog before you go. Sure. If you take them to England. Um, but yeah, um, yeah. it's, it's the kind of thing that's really hard to like people, use it as a zombie disease kind of idea. Right, yeah, yeah. But it's really hard to spread if you're spreading through bites. No, that one that the cats put in our brain. <laughs> that make, one, that's yeah, Toxoplasmosa Toxoplas- Gandhi. Toxoplas- that's the real viable sci-fi mm-hmm. root of zombies, yeah. obviously. I mean, Crack based a whole book on that, so yeah. I, yeah. <laughs> All right, so let me ask you this. Yes. Um, we were originally slated to talk about microaggressions. Yeah. Which probably includes how much I interrupt you. But I interrupt everyone that much, so I hope that mitigates it somewhat. Um, I, I don't take it personally. But you're welcome to bring it up next episode. Um, they're called Michael aggressions. Uh. <laughs> but uh, but you chose to come in wanting to talk a bit about yeah. the divorce and things like that. Do you feel the divorce is still affecting you emotionally to this day? Is that why you came in with that? I think that it's such a big it's such a big and impactful event in my life mm-hmm. that it has ripples today for sure. Um, it, it affects me in that I see who my dad is and what, who he was in the time intermittent between when I was born and now. Right. And I don't want to be that. So it is something that drives me still. As like a cautionary tale, yeah. so to speak. It's something that I look at and I go, no, that's never going to be me. Mm. And so even the parts of him that are good, I still, I'm bound to err in those ways too, because I don't want any part of him. Oh, really? As a part of me. Yeah. That's an interesting insight. And it's, yeah. It's a, it's a fear that I think is obviously founded in reality, but it's also uh-huh. like, it's damaging to not be able to see any good. Can I play hackneyed therapist and ask for three positive attributes of your birth father? Yeah. Um, he is, he is very loving. Sure. 
Um, I see him with his family and he has no problem expressing like actual, like outward love and things like that. This is something that is both good and bad about him. He is a selfish person. Okay. And I say it's good because he's never going to let something that is, he's never going to let something affect him to the point where it's super damaging to him. But it's also something that obviously it, it hurt me. Right, right, so, right, right. But there's another extreme though. I can definitely be a doormat in my personal relationships. Exactly. And you get there, different problems. Yeah, yeah. There's an amount of selfishness that is healthy to have. Sure. Yeah. Assertiveness. They call yeah. it, I believe. <laughs> yes. Um, one more thing. He's, he, he's fun. Like he's really, he's really fun. And dad's man. Yeah. He's funny and he's, he has no problem doing things that are embarrassing or mm. like he has no problem being the butt of a joke. Yeah. He's, he's really good. He's confident. He's yeah. super confident. And that's something that, that I guess the part of me that doesn't want to be like that, that's what makes me quiet and like want to listen more and there's a point where I've had this problem because I don't want to speak up in pitch meetings and stuff like that too. I get to the point where like I have all these ideas that I'm having, mm -hmm. but then I'm like, I, I don't want to, I don't want to interrupt anybody. I don't want to. Cause that's the like, kind of thing your dad would do. Right. Cause wow. he is yeah. assertive and he's confident and he's sure yeah. that his idea is going to be like, and so even when I have good ideas and when I have things like that, I have a hard time just opening up. I'm learning the opposite, as I just alluded to, which is the whole renaissance of progressive thought I think we're living through in the last yeah. few years is like recognizing my confidence comes from a privileged place. So trying to censor myself for the sake, literally for the just for the sake of rebalancing sure. the energy in the room. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and that's also an interesting thing. There was this great uh, dang it. I wish I could remember the name of the podcast because I'd shout it out. But there's a podcast episode where they talked about a study revealing that even on the fucking Supreme Court, yeah. like Ruth Bader Ginsburg yeah. is interrupted 75% of the uh, time and Antonin Scalia has never been interrupted in eight <laughs> years. Because it's literally yeah. illegal. I didn't know this either. It's codified as illegal to interrupt a Supreme Court justice really? during your time before them. Okay. If they interject and go... Well, now, now, I think this, this. You're mm -hmm. not supposed to fight back. Like, you're not supposed uh, to interrupt okay. back. And people still do. And mm -hmm. they don't censure them unless it right. gets really ornery. But it's technically illegal. Okay. And uh, so they did this study about how, like, every female justice is not only interrupted by the other justices, yeah. by, like, sevenfold of what they would interrupt <sighs> a male colleague, but all lawyers, including females, which I think yeah. is important. We're acculturated to biases, no yeah. matter who we are. Um like lawyers will interrupt Ruth Bader Ginsburg because it just seems yeah. okay. It's very insidious and weird. Yeah, it is. And we're all working on it, but yeah, it's neither here nor there, I guess. <laughs> I mean, I, I think that's, that makes sense. That's good. That's a good topic to bring up though, because that's, I mean, that goes in with the microaggressions. Definitely. But, um, yeah, it's, it's weird. And like I said, I see a part of him that is like that, that I, I know now would be healthy for me to be like that, but there's just an instinctive part of me that goes, Nope, that's not it. That's sure. not, that's the wrong answer. And yeah. So, you may, you're just making me a uh, introspect. Yeah. Cause the one way my dad and I are almost carbon copies of each other, sure. except for the fact that his emotional inner life is very, very stable and surface level. And I don't even mean that in a bad way. Sure. He's always fine. <laughs> Almost like the Buddha would be. Like, I think that's <laughs> amazing. It's like, it's a nice job if you can get it. Yeah. Like when shit is going wrong, he's always just like, well, shit is going wrong. Let's do this, then this. And every time you see him, he's just like, how you doing? That's his like <laughs> default setting. Right. And the and. I, I think rebelled against that hard by doing shit like this podcast. Like... <laughs> I'm addicted to being extremely vulnerable with people right. and will like meet new people and be like, what's the worst thing that ever happened? <laughs> Cause it's the kind of thing my dad would never ask. Right. Even after knowing you for 25 years. Yeah. And for some, yeah, it's weird. Yeah. There's, I'm, I would say that there's a part of me that 
because he's like that. The the opposite for me is I'm always open and willing to accept people at whatever level they want to meet me at. It's so the vulnerability from my part, I don't open up easy mm-hmm. usually like this. Like I said, when I texted you, I said, I'm feeling brave today. Right. So I want to do something like this. That's nuts to me because this is easy for me. Right. Almost enjoyably like compelling to do. And I would never fight a kid after school. <laughs> if a coyote attacked me, I would feed it my right hand, <laughs> hoping to sate it so that I could escape because I'm left handed. Yeah. Okay. Like I have no, it's interesting. The physical versus the emotional plane. Yeah. And, but yeah, so this kind of stuff is not usually easy for me. Okay. I understand, but I'm a very heady person. So me cognitively understanding the value in doing it. Right. Gets me to do it. It, nice. it, it gets me to go, okay, yeah, you can do this. This is something that even though it, cause it took me, I don't know how long I've, I've talked to my mom about the way that I feel about my dad a little bit. And I've talked to my wife about it, but mm-hmm. I don't know who else I've actually like gotten in depth about it with. And so it's, it's something that I'm just now in the last couple of years able to talk about without getting super emotional about it because it's not as stored up as it used to be. Have you ever seen a therapist regularly? I, I did, um, was not for that specifically. Right, right, right. Um, but of course I end up talking about it, have to go through my backstory and everything. Um, but I'm also the type of person that I seeing a therapist, I don't know if it scares me, but it is certainly something that I'm like, no, I'll be okay. Okay. I'll, I'll be fine. It's don't worry about it. I'm, I, I can deal with it. I'm it's that okay. way with medic mood medication, which is a classic people who have, they do. Debri- I, and I'm one of them resist the idea that I need a pill to make my mood stable. Right. But if you do, you do. And you yeah. should like accept it. I love therapy. Therapy to me <laughs> feels like a luxury, like a day yeah. spa treatment that I'm like yeah. lucky to be getting. Um, but I do go, I think it ties in this episode because the classic, whenever I go to therapy, I never understand. And I don't know who's right. Or if the science know who's right <laughs> Is all this shit from my childhood, like my parents and how they acted and whether they were divorced or not or together, but hated each other. Is that what's affecting me in the present moment? Or am I just a sequence of impulses, desires and chemical profiles that were shaped by those events, Mm -hmm. but now just function in the present? And unfortunately, therapists will usually say, well, that's up (laughs) to you to decide (laughs) after we talk for a million hours. But yeah. Do you have any thoughts on that? I think that we are certainly a product of our environment. There's no way to me that you can think that somebody, because we are, I think the evidence is in something like history. People 1400 years ago were genetically identical to us. They're, we have not evolved at all in that amount of time. That's nothing in geologic time. It's nothing when it comes to the actual evolution of the species. But those people were much more comfortable with like filth, with getting wars then happened uh, by people going and stabbing each other to death. And watching brutal public executions yeah. while you eat a picnic with your children. Exactly. That was entertainment. Whereas nowadays if someone did that and they said, oh, that was enjoyable, we'd go, what is wrong with you? Yeah. That's insane. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so there's there's certainly a part of us that is that is malleable because of, by the environment that we live in. And I think that's just... Uh, a part of our species because we've evolved. I mean, we've existed in so many different places in the world. We are the most right. adaptable species besides some forms of like bacteria maybe. and ants, maybe dogs. Well, I guess I'm not. So again, the differentiation is between nature and nurture. Cause I'm like, right. dogs are so adaptable. I mean, meaning they've changed forms so extremely because of selective breeding, but yeah. that's, Genetics and it's so confusing to me because then mm-hmm. they, they have those studies where twins get separated at birth and then they marry like 
a spouse with the same name, name yeah. their five kids the same names, and have the same job, and all drive a Hyundai Elantra. Right. And so, like, man, where is that line? It's yeah. crazy to think. There, I'm sure there's an amount of genetic coding because there's obviously genetic coding is the answer for why some people get cancer and some people right. don't. There's, but at the same time, I really resent when people are like, I don't think there's a priori qualities. Mm -hmm. I guess the easy way to say that is I honestly believe and accept if I were raised in a community where ISIS was the heroes and yeah. Sharia law was the thing, I'd be just as likely to be on board as sure. anyone who's on board. Yeah, yeah, that's how that goes. And that's, yeah, that's completely fair. And I think that's, that is more realistic than people thinking that they know better, that no, I would know what good and wrong is. I would know what the good thing to do is, or no, you don't like that's you're taught what's right and wrong. Sure. There might be a time when you question it, but mm -hmm. if there's enough noise telling you that it's correct, then you're going to believe that that's correct because that's because we're such a social species that being a part of the group is more important than doing what you think is right yeah, or wrong. That's true. That's just how we are. Do you think it's just, what do you feel about the outliers that do exist? So like, you know, 99 out of 100 people in this incredibly repressive situation, whatever it may be. And then the one who is like, does transcend it somehow. Yeah. Is that just chance? Because uh, Jen and I were just at the African American History Museum in Detroit. Yeah. And they had an amazing thing that I think everyone needs to be aware of if you're not already, <laughs> which is, of course, a privileged luxury to not know this already. Um, I think we have a, a feeling that when the slave ships first came in. Yeah. It took a long time for people, by and large, to be like, oh, they aren't different than us. They're humans. Right. This is wrong. Wow, slavery's bad. And this abolition movement slowly grew. Right. But one of the greatest things I found in this museum was a collection of journal entries from people who, which is actually heartening to me, yeah. did immediately know, like, <laughs> the ship landed. They heard that we're going to use Africans for slave labor. Yeah. And we're like, Wait, what now? What the fuck? Yeah. This is antithetical to everything the nation's built on. Mm -hmm. And like, God will damn us all to hell. This <laughs> yeah. is the most evil thing I can imagine. So like from day one, it was an extreme yeah. minority. Yeah. But there, I just wonder what instills in people that ability to be like, to transcend history and right. go, nah, fuck this shit. Yeah. <laughs> like I, your Che Guevara's or whatever, yeah. you know? Yeah. I think, <clears throat> I think there is a part of us. There's going to be some gene that that we identify at some point that makes people more explorative because there's there's an amount of people that it's fair. There's some exploration that's needed with humans because that's how we progress. We never would have stopped hunting and gathering. Right. We never would have gone out of small bands of people and we never would have crossed that mountain. We never would have done that without somebody who had the drive to do it. I guess that's never occurred to me because from an evolutionary standpoint, why did we evolve beyond simple villages? Right. That's enough to keep us alive until mating age. Mm -hmm. So we have this innate curiosity. Yeah, please go on. I'm fascinated. Yeah, I think, <laughs> but yeah, I do. I think there's, there's that curiosity gene that is just stronger in some people because it makes sense from an evolutionary perspective for people to enjoy comfort and safety because that's what's going to get us to the age where we can make more of us. Right. <laughs> but it also makes sense because we're such, we're such adaptive social animals and we like to that. Not everybody was looking at the stars thinking, how do I get up there? How do I fly up there? That had to be somebody who thought, no, the next step is not just going across the ocean. The yeah. next step is flying. That's something that I need to do. And I will do it at great personal cost. The chance of dying. I, yeah. I will risk my life to try to achieve something new because something new and novel is what is really interesting to me. It's weird how we have such complex deferred repercussions though like Vonnegut famously said one of the things about human life nowadays is we don't know enough to know whether news is good news or bad news mm -hmm. you just made me flash on Charles Lindbergh if like someone could have <laughs> tell him like yeah 
carpe diem. You realize yeah. man needs to fly. Fly across the Atlantic. What's the negative? You'll become so famous a Nazi will kidnap your baby. <laughs> yeah. Do you still want to do it? Right. Like, you can't know that shit right. ahead of time. <laughs> and, and I do think that people, there, there are a certain amount of people in the human population that are going to think that see the option to like Elon Musk needs people to go to Mars who are going to live there and die there. This right. is a suicide mission. This is something that you will never see the benefits from. My best friend is down with that. And it's something I can't, I don't understand how he could think that way. And right. he is like, I get it. Yeah. No, I would go to Mars and die on Mars. Yeah. There's, there's, <laughs> yeah. And I think, would you? Yeah. I think I would. Really? Yeah. We don't have time, but I want to do an episode (laughs) when we talk about microaggressions. I might also ask you, how can you go to war? Why would you want to go to space and die? The comfort gene is very strong in me. I don't understand leaving your comfort zone. (laughs) There's, I I will say one thing about that gene, however strong it is in me. I think that it comes from the need. Me, the coyote story made me think of this. There is a need at one point in our history, in our human history, that we were vulnerable to attacks by animals, that we were very vulnerable. And most people, and the fight or flight response is a real thing. And most people are going to want to run away from it. But we need a certain number of people who are willing to stand and fight. Consequences be damned. I, if I die, that's okay, because it's going to let other people progress there's there's a need for that gene in us because otherwise we'd get picked off one by one but w- but there are prey species sure. that survive yeah i'm just we, wondering what it, humanity would be like if we had become a creature that always ran <laughs> <laughs> you know like a gazelle yeah i think you're right that it's impossible to there wouldn't be the level of society or technology because you need some kind of full unsurmountable dominance Mm -hmm. to start doing shit like well maybe we'll invent microchips and shit like that's (laughs) that's high level shit you need to be pretty confident in your shelter Mm -hmm. your babies mostly live everyone has food yeah very fascinating r.i.p stephen hawking am i right Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) yeah yeah and uh, I like that this started as very much a Tales from the Pit and then verged a little on a pop culture Petri dish. <laughs> Which, as That's always... That's what you get with me. <laughs> you can catch on the Small Beans Network. Yeah. Yeah, we are about ready to wrap up here. Do you have any parting words of wisdom or things that I interrupted so much you didn't get to say? <laughs> um, I guess my only words of wisdom, uh, since we were talking about parents and stuff mm-hmm. like that, there comes a point in everybody's life you are going to be affected by your parents for your entire life. They raised you. They yeah. had, even And even if they didn't raise you like my dad, they impacted you in a way that is going to be forever. But there comes a point in your life where you can do what you need to do, where you can make that decision to, to put an effort into being your own person. There's something... My dad wanted me to be a doctor. He saw that I was good at mm-hmm. math when I was a when I was a kid, mm-hmm. and he was like, "This, you should do that." You should. Was he high pressure about it? He wasn't high pressure about it. It was just his stated opinion. Yes. Okay. <laughs> he, he he always thought it wasn't high pressure, but he did always think one day you're going to be a doctor. Okay. And he put that on me. I rebelled against it, obviously, and like, no, I'm opposite. I'm <laughs> I want to do art. Um, Wait, your hands are covered in blood. I thought that was. <laughs> That's a different. You need to explain I was yourself, doing art. Right? I was oh, finger okay. painting. Gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> the highest form of art, finger painting. <laughs> but no, there's there's an amount that you can. There's comes a point when you can decide how much your parents are going to impact you or are going to continue to impact you, because they are not perfect. You learn that. Mm-hmm. You learn eventually that your parents are not perfect. They are not the gods of your life. They do not set down undefiable laws Mm -hmm. what they taught you is what they were taught what they learned in their life so it's up to you to take the lessons that were good to take the lessons that were bad and to decide which ones you're going to live by yeah 
And it's hard while you're still strongly being affected by them because you want to react emotionally. But the more distance you get, the easier it is. I agree. I'm going through that now. Um, Because, as you said, you can also react against good things and shoot in the opposite direction. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much. Thanks for being brave. Uh, I'm sure we'll have you back soon. I'd love to. In this horrible, dank pit. <laughs> Look it's all right. Us. It's a little wet today. It's dreary. But it's good. It's the slime that clings to the walls of hell. <laughs> I like the decor, though. It's oh, all right. you're ruining the vibe. <laughs> organ solo. Cue organ solo. Now, <laughs> where can people find you, Christian? Uh, they can find me on Twitter at Fanboy Christian. That's Christian with no H. And they can find me on the Small Beans Network. Uh, yeah, I'll be here making pop culture Petri dish and hopefully another one of these sometime. Hell yeah, man. All right. We got to do an episode at some point about the relationship between realizing your parents aren't perfect and, and I'm going out on a limb here cause I don't yeah. know if you, I don't know what you believe Christian right. with no H <laughs> realizing that there is no God by which I mean, there is no caring force that will come to your rescue. The, your parents, once they go away are really gone and there's no one to take that place. Yeah. That I don't, I'm still working on that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm happy to get into that. Like the, not happy, but yeah. the universe is inherently not unfair, but it's not fair either. Right. It's the universe neutral. is neutral. Yeah. <laughs> That's fucking rough. Yeah. <laughs> All right. An issue for another time. Thanks so much, Christian. Say goodbye. Goodbye. This has been a Small Beans Endeavor. We're a bunch of pals who make podcasts, sketches, music, web series, and movies. The beans always have new ideas percolating, so make sure to check us out at patreon.com slash smallbeans. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash smallbeans, where you can browse all of our current and past content, see what we've got planned in the future, and learn how your support can help the small beans grow into huge, giant monster beans. If you enjoyed this content module, please like, rate, subscribe, or tell a friend about us. We love you!